I'm Karen Higgins, and I am an ICU nurse at Boston Medical Center, but I'm here hopefully to uh, provide comprehensive recommendations for appropriate um, acuity criteria that we believe should be included in the acuity tool and that all hospitals should be adopting for ICU nurses. And I believe they've given you a copy, so I am not going through the whole thing. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights of what we have concerns about. Um, just to give you a quick update, we actually met with several hundred ICU nurses who worked in all manners of ICUs across the um, state of Massachusetts, from the largest tertiary groups to the smallest community hospitals in every state. And we asked them um, to tell us for their units and their patients what clinical factors um, or level of patient status would dictate a one-to-one -one assignment. And so we got all the information, we went back, we reviewed it again, went back to the ICU nurses a second time to make sure that we were right. Um, there were three sets of recommendations of the criteria that was developed in the types of ICU. So there is the medical ICU, surgical ICU, coronary care unit, burn trauma unit, and then there was a separate set of um, protocols set up for pediatric ICUs and neonatal ICUs. Um, and as you can see, if you leave through the top of this criteria, there's a very, especially in the MICU, medical ICU and the SICU, there's various clinical criteria. Um, that is further categorized under specific headings such as issues related to patients with respiratory issues, cardiac issues, surgical, neurological, and so on. Um, as you look at the first set, there's about 43 specific situations that we feel strongly patients would be considered to be one-to-one -one, um, if they are opposed to cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, a ventilator dependent or intubated patient requiring frequent interventions for respiratory compliance, um, suctioning, trach care, sedation protocols, um, patients in septic or cardiogenic shock requiring continuous monitoring um, and needing multiple intravenous vasopressors and hemodynamically unstable. Um, patients in acute um, organ failure, which is liver, kidney, brain, require constant monitoring and intervention. And we have a similar list if you look at it for the pediatric and neonatal um, patients as well. Um, and all of these lists, it's our recommendations would demand that these situations would demand a one-to-one -one assignment without exception. Uh, further on in our recommendations, um, as we looked at the acuity too, we asked, look at the, um, when the patient comes into the ICU is admitted, um, and then it's verified about every four hours at least in how this patient is doing, and that it gives the nurse the ability that if the changes in the patient require that the patient then become one-to-one, -one, um, that there is a system where she can actually bring that up and have that happen so that, in fact, the patient will continue to get the care that they deserve and not be left hanging uh, because there isn't somebody else there to help them out. Um, so we know that. We believe of all the criteria and um, we believe all of this criteria and potentially more should be included when you look at the acuity system. Um, and we want to avoid any confusion and leave in no door open that gives you opportunity for it to be circumvented or not followed through with. Um, I think the law has been very clear on what we need to have in place um, and that ensure that this is a tool, as we all said, and that it's still up to the nurse to make that decision. As we look further on um, in the list of, uh, we needed to look at the environmental factors, and we believe these are essential when we look at an acuity system. Um, again, if you look at the top of, two, of the two pages of each set of criteria, you'll see essential environmental factors that we think also play a role. Um, a clinical assignment for a regularly scheduled uh, nurse on a particular ICU may be significantly different on a unit than it was staffed with temporary nurses, per diem nurses or travel nurses. We need to look at the availability and the nature of the support staff, um, which also impacts the ability of that nurse to be able to take care of that of more than one patient or just one patient. And that's the question of whether is there a hospitalist in the unit? Um, is there a physician assistant in the unit? Is there a secretary in that unit? Um, the appropriate number of aides to be able to assist with the patient's care. We want to look at the physical layout of the unit. It must be considered. Is the patient in one room? Are there more than one patient in a room? Um, we want to look at, is it, is it visibly easy to see this patient? Is it easy to see the monitoring of this patient? Uh, we need to look at that. We need to look at the equipment that's available um, that helps in taking care of patients, whether it's the type of bed we're using, 
whether it's lifting equipment. Um, this all affects everything that we do. Um, now coming into play in the last couple of years has now been wonderfully well of our documentation system and uh, our medication administration, which has been changing drastically for us in the last couple of years. And these are hugely playing a factor um, in time, in, our, in, our, in the use of our time, and being able to take care of more than one critically ill patient. So we need to look at that very, very carefully. Uh, we also believe this should be a means of calculating the time required now to actually admit and discharge a patient, as well as the account of time it takes when um, a staff has to transport a patient, when we respond to codes, which most of us do. And we are now also becoming part of what they call a rapid response team, which is when there's an event out on the floors. And in some cases, even if it's not a patient that um, unfortunately um, has an event within the hospital when they're visiting, um, a lot of places it's the ER nurses that are responding and sometimes what we try to do is assist them with that. So these all actually take away and continue to play a role in what we do trying to take care of critically ill patients. We believe the acuity system must include both these factors. Now the only thing that I really wanted to also bring up because it came up in the discussion when we were talking to the ICU nurses is that when patients are um, discharged from ICUs, uh, we're finding that there's been a lot of concern from nurses that they feel the patients are being, quote, dumped out of ICUs and onto either a step down or a floor, um, not because the patient was really ready to go, but because they felt that they needed that bed for another patient. And we find this is becoming a huge issue. And we want to be really clear that um, if that patient still meets that criteria, that acuity criteria, um, that they should not be moved out, or if they're going to be moved out, that we provide the same level of care that they would require in the unit, outside of that unit. We have similar concerns about the ER. Um, Again, I don't oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just finish this one because I think you need to hear it. Because what we're finding is the patients in the ER, it's the same issue. Patients are in the ER, they're sitting in the ER waiting for an ICU bed, and that ICU patient, ha that nurse has several other patients as well as that ICU patient to take care of. So we need that to be looked at um, as, far, as far as going forward. And I think that is pretty much, other than the 20,000 pages you have, of what we are um, highly I recommending. I, um, but I just wanted to hit the highlights. Thank you. Thank you.